Isn't it a beautiful night, a beautiful day in LA? Aren't you glad you don't live in, you know, like Virginia? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I am uh, here just to very briefly welcome you. Uh, I'm sorry to say that my dean, uh, Dana Goldman, is unable to join us. Uh, and uh, I do want to mention that this is our last um, George Washington Leadership Series uh, meeting with, with him. We're going to have a new dean. He's stepping away. Uh, we're pretty happy with his stepping away. <laughs> He, uh, he's going to take over what is known as the Schaefer Institute in Washington, D.C., uh, and he raised $60 million to start that institute for USC Price. So, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, but we will miss him, and, and, and hopefully uh, we'll have a new dean by the next time we do this. We'll certainly have an interim dean that's supposed to be announced in a little bit. Uh, just a qu very quick uh, recollection. This uh, series started 10 years ago. This is the end of the 10th year uh, anniversary, if you will, of this series. Uh, and it started with uh, me doing something which I'm an historian. I have a PhD in American history. And I have to tell you that one of the most amazing in, uh, things that ever happened to me was I got to stay at George Washington's house. And uh, not in the big mansion, but nearby. And uh, it was an amazing thing. And I met with the director at that time. And he said, how would you like to do a lecture series around leadership? And we said, absolutely. And then he said, well, I know this woman <laughs> named Mary Beth Borthwick, who's willing to support that and endow it. And at that point, my dean went, yes. <laughs> And so I would like to thank Mary Beth and Hale, who are the people that endowed this lecture series. And um, she doesn't really like me to do this, but it's an amazing thing that she did it. And I think we all could say thank you. So uh, very briefly, um, I am fortunate to have the opportunity to introduce our next speaker, um, Patrick Spiro who's the executive director of the George Washington National Library at Mount Vernon. Uh, Patrick is going to introduce the night's e events in different ways. He's going to talk a little bit about attorney generals, but he's also going to just talk about more about this idea of our lecture series. So will you please welcome Patrick Spiro. Thank you, David. And it's been great to get to work with you on this uh, project. And we've had a lot of great discussions and a lot of agreement, but uh, tonight I have to disagree with you. Spring in Virginia is pretty spectacular. <laughs> so um, I also want to take a moment to thank Mary Beth Borthwick and Hal for creating this uh, incredible opportunity, this bi-coastal relationship connecting East and West, uh, which I think is so vital. Uh, it reflects, I think, George Washington's belief that we are one country connected and it's uh, exchanges like this that remind us how we are a one nation connected, no matter how far apart we are. So thank you, Mary Beth. You probably know Mary Beth is a, an alumna of uh, USC, but she's also a vice regent of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. And we're also joined tonight with uh, the regent of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, Meg Nichols, and her husband, David. So, well. And if you're not familiar with the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, you really should be. So give me a second to give you a brief uh, synopsis. Uh, in 1853, uh, George Washington's Mount Vernon, that spectacular place that David got to stay at, that really, for anybody that visits, can be a transformative experience to connect with the founder of our country, the leader of, uh, of the revolution, but more importantly, the person who established the presidency and the foundations of the republic that we all still live in. Um, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association learned, a, a group of women in 1853 learned that Mount Vernon was dilapidated and that the heirs were considering, the Washington heirs were considering selling it off to developers. And a group of civically minded patriotic women banded together in 1853 to raise the money to save this national treasure and preserve the building and open it up to the public to uh, educate generations of Americans in the principles upon which our republic rests. It's an incredible legacy, and I think we all owe the, both of them and their other, uh, the other ladies uh, on the board a round of applause as well. Uh, 
Now, I've uh, been going around and meeting people, and everyone I meet always says, oh, I remember going to Mount Vernon when I was a kid. How many people here went to Mount Vernon as a kid? <laughs> yeah, most of the audience. That's great. But I have to tell you, I've learned something else, that you have to visit Mount Vernon at least twice. You have to go as a kid, but then you have to go again as an adult, because I can tell you, you're going to have a different experience. You're going to see it differently. So go at least twice. And if you live long enough, three or four times. <laughs> Um, as David said, this is the 10th anniversary of uh, this partnership, but it's also the 10th anniversary of the George Washington Presidential Library. The library was founded in 2013, but at Mount Vernon, we always like to point out when George Washington was first. And if you ever get a chance to visit the library, you'll be greeted by a letter that George Washington wrote in 1797, coming back from the presidency, in which he says there's only one house he has left to build on Mount Vernon. It's a house for his papers. And he wanted to store his papers on Mount Vernon, not for himself, but for posterity. And he makes it clear that he wanted to open up this building and Mount Vernon to the public so it could be a site for research. And so the Mount Vernon Ladies Association raised over $100 million to create a presidential library in 2013. And today I can tell you it's a dynamic center for research and discovery. We've hosted over 180 fellows from around the globe conducting original research in the founding era. I describe the, li the library as a laboratory for the humanities, just like scientists have laboratories where they conduct original research and make discoveries. That's what happens every day in our presidential library with our fellows and other scholars. Um, and it's particularly fitting on this 10th anniversary that, as David said, this is the second in our series. Our first hosted Carla Hayden, the librarian of Congress, who talked about the role of libraries in 21st century America. And I think it's fitting that we now have the Attorney General of California as our second guest, because it was, after all, George Washington who established the Office of Attorney General during his presidency. And I'm looking forward to this conversation we're going to have about the role of the Attorney General and leadership in the 21st century. Now, as David said, uh, by tradition, the director of the library usually gives a mini historical lecture. Um, I have to admit that I know you all are here to hear the Attorney General, not me. So if you only give me a, a brief digression to tell you two stories that I think might be relevant for tonight. The first is from Washington's time and the other one's a little closer to our own. The first is about that first Attorney General, Edmund Randolph. How many folks here have heard of Edmund Randolph before? I had a fair number. It's probably all the lawyers in the room. <laughs> So he is a remarkable figure, and I think he has a lesson for us today. Um, Randolph was a leader in Virginia. Uh, during the American Revolution, he served as the state's first attorney general of the state for almost a decade. In 1786, as the Articles of Confederation were collapsing, he was the governor of Virginia, and he was actually at the head of the delegation that went to the Constitutional Convention with George Washington and George Mason and others. And he's the one who presented the Virginia plan to the Constitutional Convention. He supported the re reforming of the Articles of Confederation. He supported creating a new government. But over the course of the conversation in Philadelphia, he realized that the document that they drafted, he no longer agreed with. And so he was one of the three people who did not sign the Constitutional Convention, uh, 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 Constitution at the convention. Albert, Albert Jerry, George Mason, and Edmund Randolph. He entered supporting the Constitution or the idea of it. He left not supporting it. Well, the ratification convention happens in Virginia. And what does Edmund Randolph do? He realizes that even though he had his objections to the Constitution, that it was better than nothing. And what he said is, the decision we have before us is, are we going to have a union or are we not going to have a union? And so he decided to support the Constitutional Convention, uh, to support the Constitution at the convention, the state convention, and he actually rallied another, uh, a number of anti-federalists who had also opposed the Constitution to support it as well, and allowed Virginia to ratify the Constitution, which was essential because it was the largest state in Virginia. Well, fast forward, he becomes the first attorney general. And his inclinations are to be a Jeffersonian, somebody who feared the federal government, who feared the, the, the national bank that Hamilton and Washington created. But he realized that the nation was more important than his political beliefs. And so he tried to always support Washington even when he disagreed with him. And in my own research, I have a book coming out, Randolph Plays a Central Role. And it's a very kind of arcane historical episode. But what happens is Washington wants to call out the militia in the West because they're a group of frontiersmen who are threatening an insurrection. And he wants to call on the militia to try and suppress it. Randolph says, technically, you don't have the authority to do so, do so according to the law. 
Washington disagrees with them. He says, as commander in chief, I have to protect the union and the constitution, so I, I can call it the militia. Randolph says, you may be able to do that, but you have to pass a law to establish it. This is how you establish government and precedent. Well, Washington disagreed with Randolph. He calls out the militia, but then he also says, you know what, Randolph, you're right. Let's also pass a law to clarify that. So what do I take out of this lesson? That Randolph, people have always said, oh, he's, he's a vacilla, he vacillates, he's weak, he's not a strong leader, he has these ideas, but he always, you know, bends to them. That's not what Randolph is. What Randolph is is a pragmatist, not a dogmatist. He doesn't believe in dogma, he believes in pragmatism. And that's a lesson that I think we all might take with us today. The second story is more about California here. And I studied the 18th century, not 19th century or 20th century America, but I was interested to learn about the attorney generalship here in California. My first question was in that first constitution uh, California passed in 1849 to become a state, how did they, de they de describe the attorney general? I personally was interested, did the federal constitution influence constitution writing in California? What I can tell you is it didn't, as far as I can tell. They barely mentioned the attorney general. And as I researched this further, it turned out that the this is a frontier government, you know, there's not a large population, everyone's dispersed. The attorney generalship in this period was basically a sinecure, where it was a lawyer who got elected, he worked, you know, maybe a day a week, and the rest of the time he had a private practice. And it appeared that, you know, if you were an attorney general, your private practice was going to boom while you're attorney general. So there was maybe a little conflict of interest there. So fast forward to the 1930s, 1938. So this is now after the first quarter of the 20th century, California's attorney generalship is still this part-time position in which most people are private practice lawyers more than attorney generals. And so Earl Warren, a name that I know is familiar to many of you, mobilized the state to create the modern position of attorney general. And I looked at the language he drafted for Proposition 319, which was passed in 1938, and the language is almost identical to the language that is in the Constitution today. And I know in California, you all are creating these propositions that change your Constitution all the time. <laughs> it took me a little while to research all this <laughs> because of that. Uh, but the language for the Attorney General is almost identical to what Warren crafted in 1938. And that, to me, is a lesson about leadership, about vision, about believing you can reform your government to make it better. And I think that's also a lesson for us, and I know it's one the Attorney General today believes in deeply. So I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. I want to th turn things over to David, who I think is going to say a few more words about the Attorney General. So on April 21st, 23rd, uh, 2021, Rob Bonta was sworn in as the 34th Attorney General in the state of California. He was the first person of Filipino descent and the second Asian American to occupy the position. Anybody want to take a guess at the first? The Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. A remarkable welcome change in an office that first opened in 1850 when Edward Kewen was denied office supplies by the legislature in that part-time position. Now Attorney General uh, Bonta oversees more than 5,600 lawyers, investigators, sworn peace officers, and other employees who probably use a lot of office supplies. <laughs> Born in Quezon City in the Philippines, Attorney General Bonta immigrated to California with his family as an infant. He got his passion for justice and the law and fairness from his parents who served on the front lines of some of America's most important social justice movements. His father walked in Selma, his mother fought against the Marcos regime, and he learned valuable lessons from struggles he had with the, in, the, in, the, in, the work play, in the homes of the United Farm Workers. As a result, Attorney General Banta learned to stand up for those who are taken advantage of or harmed. It's so why he decided to become a lawyer, to help right wrongs, and fight for people who need help. He graduated for, with honors from Yale University and attended Yale Law School. Prior to serving in his current role, Attorney General Bonta served in the State Assembly, working to enact nation-leading reforms to inject more justice and fairness into government and institution. Now he seeks accountability from those who abuse their power 
to harm others. Throughout his career, he has taken on critical issues such as corporate accountability, workers' rights, environmental concerns, racial justice, and the criminal justice system, where he helped ban private prisons and detention facilities in California, as well, in, as, well as pushing to eliminate cash bail. Please welcome Attorney General Bonta to the George Washington Leadership Series at USC Price. Thank you for coming. We're very happy to have you. Um, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of things here, and then we're going to take some of your questions. You notice there was a little box outside asking for you to write questions, and we'll pick those up as we go along. Um, I'm going to start with uh, two questions about your growing up. The first is, um, you're a Filipino. In the US, uh, it, the Filipino minority has been largely obscured in our nation, and yet has played a huge role in our society and is one of the leading uh, numbers of immigrants in the United States. And I was wondering, did that Filipino, did growing up as a Filipino in, uh, influence your decision to study law and eventually become attorney general? First, let me say, good evening, everybody. Honored to be here with all of you. Thanks for the opportunity. Wonderful to be part of this lecture series and this uh, remarkable partnership. Um, and with respect to the question, we, I think we, we all bring our lived experiences to what we do. And a critical part of my lived experience is being Filipino-American, being born in the Philippines, being born in the Philippines at a time when, right after I was born, my parents asked themselves this question. They asked themselves, can we raise our son here at this time and at this place and guarantee that he has democracy, freedom, human rights, civil rights, the rule of law, due process? And their answer was no, that um, they could not guarantee that. And they were right. A, a dictator was rising to power. Martial law was around the corner. It was declared on the same day as my first birthday. So when I was two months old, my parents brought me here, uh, literally here, to Los Angeles, to California, to Echo Park, and started, um, thank you, <laughs> go Los Angeles, and Echo Park. And they also knew that you can't put your chin on your elbow and look out the window and hope for the things that you want. You have to work for the things that you want, fight for the things that you want, demand the things. And the things they wanted for me, they wanted to fight for. So they started working for the United Farm Workers of America. Uh, here in LA, they started uh, with joining the uh, lettuce boycott, collecting signatures outside of supermarkets, had their clipboards and their sleeves rolled up, were then later invited to uh, La Paz, the headquarters. Uh, where we moved and we lived in a trailer. I say we, it was my older sister, me, my brother was born when we were there, my mom and dad. They got $5 a week for their service to the union and the movement. Uh, my dad worked in the front office with Cesar Chavez. He helped set up healthcare clinics for the farm workers in California, in Florida. My mom worked in the preschool. She worked with Dolores Huerta. Uh, I'm proud that I get to work with Dolores Huerta today and that she's still with us fighting for justice and uh, for improving the lives of, of those who, who need to be fought for. Um, and they fought for fair contracts and for uh, fair and safe working conditions like bathroom breaks and shade breaks, water breaks. Um, so that defined me, that pursuit of a better life and opportunity that my parents um, you know, went on a journey to attain for themselves and, and for their children, that belief um, that if you fight and coalesce and work with others and join forces and collaborate and partner and help one another and have each other's back and care for each other, you can make tomorrow better than today. That the injustices of today uh, aren't things we just have to accept um, and tolerate and absorb, that uh, we don't have to be spectators or bystanders as our future unfolds before us. We can define our future. We can shape it. We can bend it away from unjust places and bend it towards fair places and places uh, robust with opportunity. And so um, and they taught me about agency and power and owning your power. And these are people with no positional power. Uh, my mom and dad were everyday people uh, who cared about a better future for workers and for Californians. Um, they weren't elected to anything. They didn't have a fancy title, uh, but they had uh, the most powerful thing there is in a democracy, people power. And they had each other, and they had a movement, and they had ability to 
um, make great change. And so from my dad being part of the, the uh, civil rights movement marching in Selma, my parents, United Farm Workers of America movement. And then me, like when you talk about children being shaped by their upbringing, I grew up going to rallies and demonstrations and protests. Fist in the air, um, chants coming out of my mouth with my mom, talking about the human rights abuses in the Philippines, talking about the need for democracy to be restored to the people in the Philippines, and seeing other everyday people joining. And so um, it made me, my upbringing made me believe in service, generally. I didn't even know what attorney general was. Um, I, I never thought of or dreamed I could be attorney general uh, of this state or any state. Sometimes I'll confess to you, I secretly look on the website and check to see if my photo is still there <laughs> and, and my name is still there. And um, get very uh, affirmed and excited when I see it because it, it means we can do some important work today. Um, so, but I wanted to serve. It, it was general, it was broad. And then, uh, you know, talking about again how children are impacted by their upbringing. Um, you know, I, I grew up and I, and, and I read, I, I picked up To Kill a Mockingbird one day, and I read about Atticus Finch, and I saw, I thought, if these are what attorneys are, I want to be one. Someone who fights for justice, who stands with someone when they're being treated unfairly and, and makes sure they, they fight for them and, and represent them and give them the best path for fairness and for justice. And um, so I wanted to go to law school. And then after that, I, I, I didn't know, uh, but I wanted to serve. I thought I might get into the nonprofit world. One of the best jobs I ever had was working in public housing neighborhoods with children and families. Um, I thought if I ever got, um, that I might wanna work in government, but you know, as, as a staff member or a part of a team, I never thought about running for office until, until much later. And even then, I had huge doubts about it because I believe what people said, that uh, everyone's corrupt and it's all gridlocked and you can't get anything done. Um, and so I said, and this is in my, you know, my mid, late 30s, I want to see. I want to see for myself. I want to try. And so I dipped my toe in the water, and I started with um, getting appointed to a, a special district board, the healthcare district board of Alameda. And, so, and people sometimes ask me, um, if you want to get into elected office, what do you recommend? What's your advice? And my advice is get appointed to a, a great job. Uh, it was worked for me twice, my first job and my current one. <laughs> Um, I, I say that half in jest, but it really is a good path. Um, uh, and and then and I, I asked myself in my first office, is it corrupt? Is it gridlocked? The answer was a resounding no. I saw everyday people volunteering their time, their skills, their talent to make their community better. And I wanted to be a part of it. So I stayed on that journey and every step of the way would ask myself the same question. And the answer was always yes. Um, we're doing good. We're making people's lives better. We have an opportunity to create great change. And, this job, the Attorney General of the incredible state of California, the largest state in the nation, the, uh, the best state in the nation. Sorry to all of the, uh, um, those from Maryland and DC and Virginia. Um, uh, and you know, the place where they say as California goes, so goes the nation. We have a, a responsibility and a, a leadership role to the, the nation, to the world. And um, so back to the question, being Filipino American is who I am. It's in my DNA, it's the air I breathe, um, it's part of my identity, and it certainly shaped my, my pathway. So um, I loved reading about your parents and you know, being one of those people that you became, right? And this idea of the social justice became, you know, and you're in an odd position now, right? Because you care about change and improvement, yet you're the attorney general. You're like the top cop in, a, in California. So you know, there, there's this ambiguity there. And I wonder how do you handle that ambiguity, I, it just, it strikes me that it must be, a, you know, there's no fist in the air anymore from the Attorney General, and yet you care about change. And how do you handle that in your day-to-day -day working? I think the fist is still in the air. It, 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 it will always be. It, it, and it's that spirit that has led me to this path. And you know, one time Congress member Barbara Lee introduced me at an event and um, introduced me with one of the uh, highest compliments I've ever heard. And she said, he's an activist um, elected official. He brings his community roots and activist roots into the role. And that's always been my, my hope, my desire. I, I, you know, I, I know to the, uh, one, one of the broad um, titles for the attorney general is the top cop. Um, I also, I, that's true, uh, we're the chief law enforcement officer. Um, but also I see the role as being the people's attorney and fighting for everyday people. 
and making your fights, Californians' fights, my fights, whatever they might be. Um, and today, you know, public safety is top of mind. Homelessness and housing is top of mind. We are deeply engaged in those issues, uh, fighting for them, fighting um, uh, to deliver solutions. And so I don't feel the ambiguity. I think the ambiguity mm. may be in perception, but not in reality. It, it, is, it is very much uh, a continuation of the same journey and path that I've been on uh, to, to fight for justice, to improve lives, to make people's lives better. Um, and enforcing the law, the great laws of the state of California is fully consistent with that. So um, uh, I understand some of the, the perceptions that might exist with respect to the role and, and, and my uh, history, but um, I, don't, I don't feel any ambiguity. I feel okay. uh, deep clarity. Patrick, do you wanna? Yeah, actually, this is a great segue to talk a little bit about leadership, which uh, you've probably experienced in various different ways throughout your life. Uh, earlier, you were talking about uh, being an athlete and a soccer player. So there are probably leadership skills that you learned uh, at various different points uh, in your life. And I, I want to maybe do a, a thought experiment with you. Um, if you were teaching a course, a class of people learning English for the first time, maybe they're immigrants to the United States and uh, the word of the day is, is leadership, and you had to define and explain to them what that meant. What would you say? Uh, I think a, a key part of it would be um, loving your people, hmm. loving the people that you are fighting for, working for, um, so that, that, that emotional, heartfelt, passionate, deep inside commitment to the people that you're serving, that, that and it's 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 outward facing. It's about the people that you serve, not about you. A lot of people run for titles and for power and for glory, and it's never about that. This is a job of deep public service, and um, it's also about action. You know, I, I I get asked to address a lot of problems, and I'm honored to have that that privilege to to be able to try to address the the challenges that we're facing. Um, not all f fall within my official authority, but I will always try. And, and um, I've always said to people, uh, it, as an elected official, two of the most important things you can do are one, care, and two, try. If you care about the challenges that people are raising with you, and, and I, I feel uh, I, I have a personal connection to many of them as a, as a Californian who's growing up, uh, or you know, who who's, has kids growing up here and who's been raised here, um, living many of the same challenges that people are facing, um, and then always trying to address them. But to me, try is, is, is a minimum, not a maximum. I'm always trying to deliver. And so it's about loving your people. It's about action and doing and delivering. And to me, the ultimate and only metric is, did you deliver solutions? Did you make the people you were fighting for as lives better today than they were yesterday? And that's how I see, that's how I measure myself. So action, uh, loving and serving. Yeah. That's great. I, I want to ask you about an action uh, that you might be able to take. And the, what I want to ask is, if you didn't have to worry about the structure of government, um, but could, you could make one change uh, to the justice system to improve it today, what would it be? And I guess I'd ask you about California specific, but then just more generally within American society. And maybe the answer is the same, I yeah. don't know. Like the, the criminal justice system? Any aspect. Well, let me, let me talk about the criminal justice system for a moment. Um, I think the changes that I would like to see is more focus, emphasis, resource, commitment to prevention of crime on, on the front end. And, and, and that looks like a lot of things. It includes deep investments in uh, health care and food security and job opportunity and um, anti-poverty programs and, and also on the back end rehabilitation. Mm. The belief that people can change, can be redeemed, can restore, um, that uh, uh, with opportunity and support and love and compassion and humanity, um, the thing that was done that could be the worst mistake in their life might be the, uh, you know, would be the last time they ever do anything like that and that they can turn their life around. And that takes um, resources. We have something called the CDCR, the California Department of uh, Corrections and Rehabilitation. Most people don't know that the R is even there. 
because the rehabilitation has been uh, underinvested in and not focused on. Um, and then I, I think it's important, you know, um, the justice system, crime can be very emotional. Um, everyone deserves to be safe, uh, to feel and to be safe. And uh, the fear of being a victim, the trauma of being a victim um, is painful and emotional. Um, and there are real solutions in where we go in, in science, in data, in evidence, in facts. And um, our, the steps that we take sometimes are more guided by um, emotion than they are by the evidence-based evidence pathways that will work, mm -hmm. that will get the outcome and the solution that people desire, seek, demand, hope for. So um, those are some of my, my, my thoughts on, on the criminal justice system. But um, just broadly, uh, uh, you know, justice uh, uh, as a broad issue, I think more humanity, compassion, and empathy for one another. Is, is very important. Today, we're, we have a lot of conversations that are more monologue than dialogue. People are talking past each other, not to each other. We're not listening, understanding, um, sympathizing, empathizing enough. And California has learned to live and thrive with our diversity. We're great because we're diverse, because different perspectives and different backgrounds and histories have come to one place to create uh, such a great state. And um, part of that is our, our belief in each other. And we saw some of the beauty of our humanity during one of the darkest moments uh, during COVID, uh, when people were helping each other and feeding each other and, 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 and um, you know, being good neighbors and, and good human beings. And um, uh, we need more of that to understand each other more. And what are some impediments that you've encountered to realizing this vision you just outlined for improving the criminal justice system? Are there uh, structural impediments? Is it one of um, feeling and fear over science and data, I mean, what, what are the impediments that are in the way? I mean, the, the crime is, and, and, and a, a lot of the major issues that we talk about in politics are highly politicized. Mm -hmm. uh, rarely do you get sort of um, sober, um, uh, you know, calm, solemn thinking about the issue and how to solve it and, and what a solution is. It, it, it's, you know, a lot of our problems that we face are full of pain because of lived experiences of, of, of being a victim of crime or having a loved one be a victim of crime or the fear of, of being a victim of crime. And that's real and, 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 and that is important. And um, so s some of the challenges uh, lie in some of the political disconnect um, some of the challenges lie in the detethering of solutions from facts. Um, the belief among some, more and more these days, that if there is a set of facts that are contrary to your position, then you can dismiss them. Yeah. And if there's not a set of facts that support your position, you can conjure them up. And facts to me are never to be, they're, they're undebatable, they are the facts. They are the, the foundation for whatever we do next. What your opinion is based on those facts can be whatever you wish. And logic and persuasion it will, and, um, will, will justify where we go next. But we're not rooted in facts nearly enough uh, these days in some of our, our dialogue. And um, I think the openness to do things differently, change is always hard. Mm -hmm. The status quo it is, is more easy to maintain than to, than to transform. And so there's a lot of built-in changes, but you, that, you know, that's what movements are for. They, 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 they bring an injustice to the fore. They force you to look at it and not look away. They propose solutions to address it. And you know, that's what the civil rights movement, the farm worker movement, and the, um, uh, the restoration of democracy in the Philippines were about, among many other great movements in this uh, state, nation, and world. Um, but you know, politics, emotion, detethering from facts, um, unwillingness to change are all part of the challenges. Yeah. So recently, um, a, a new challenge in the criminal justice world has arisen with the arrival of the ghost gun and how you have tried to control ghost guns but have been confronted by a legal system, a judicial system, that doesn't think in the world in which we live that any gun should be limited. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the travails around what is essentially a gun that's unregistered, 
un, unknown in how you how you, how criminal how police how how prosecutors deal with it as, as part of the system. For sure. So, and, and let me first just say this. I'll pull the camera back for a second for, for a little context. The, the Attorney General's Office, the California Department of Justice, is the largest State Department of Justice in the nation. Um, six, almost 6,000 employees, 1,200 attorneys. Uh, we do both civil work and criminal work. We mostly do civil work, um, which is, you know, that doesn't fit in with that top cop um, um, view. But we, we, we do all of the... Um, criminal appeals in court in, in the state of California for the most part. We also have our own law enforcement agents that um, are doing uh, sophisticated investigations and, 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 and arrests, of, usually of organized crime. Uh, but on the civil side, we're you know, defending and protecting your constitutional rights, your civil rights, uh, your consumer rights. Um, so because we've been focusing on criminal justice, I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about where that fits in with our, our, our broader portfolio of, of work. Ghost guns represent a new frontier on a, a long existing challenge, uh, the challenge of promoting more gun safety to more people who deserve it. And ghost guns are um, something that any person can acquire if they have a credit card and an internet connection. Uh, you can go online and purchase the component parts for a gun and then have those parts mailed to you and then with a few um, moves, um, you can put together a gun. And it doesn't have all the things that are required when you, uh, um, when you purchase a gun. Uh, there's no background check, there's no drop safety test, there's no serial number. And more and more of, of our law enforcement um, personnel throughout the state are seeing ghost guns uh, at more crimes. And it's a problem and it's a challenge. And um, you know, fentanyl is a similar type of new challenge in an older battle against um, illegal drugs. And, you know, it, it, it's powerful, it's, it's potent, it's cheap, it's lethal, and we are suffering uh, from it and um, fighting back and pushing back against it. So that, just another example of a new frontier. Uh, but ghost guns are, uh, we, we've had a battle over whether they can be treated and regulated as guns. We recently, um, submitted a, um, a written submission of multiple attorneys general in a court case to make it clear that we support the federal government's position that ghost guns can be treated and regulated as guns. Uh, but we also have a US Supreme Court that is um, issuing decisions that are changing the law on some of our, our most important um, uh, constitutional pr provisions. The Dobbs decision, uh, stripped away a 50-year constitutional right to have an abortion. That was a major um, and painful and dangerous change. The Bruin decision, a similar change in the context of Second Amendment uh, U.S. Supreme Court jurisprudence, which requires a more originalist, textual um, justification um, uh, rooted in history and historical regulation to justify a modern day regulation. And so that's been a challenge for some of the common sense gun laws that we've had in California and throughout the country that the data proves indisputably have saved lives that work, that um, protect the health and safety of, of the people of the state and this nation. So um, we'll see what the courts decide ultimately on ghost guns, but it's certainly been a challenge. I'll bet. I'll bet. Oh, by the way, I live in Echo Park. <laughs> uh, I want to, I mean, I could talk to you about, I teach a class on restorative justice, so I could talk to him about crime all night, but I'm not going to do that. I'm curious about how you um, prioritize issues. So you have this extraordinary uh, set of responsibilities from gun control to grocery stores, mergers, you have to add, do all sorts of things about corporate stuff and for and environmental stuff. And, you know, it's overwhelming, I would think, as, a, as, a, as, an, as an official, because there's just too much. And yet, you have to prioritize those issues. And Patrick has asked about leadership. What I'm curious about is the complications for you as you try to show leadership in so many areas? And do you have, find yourself having to 
spend a month on gun control and spend a month on grocery stores and spend a month on environmental degradation? Or is it so interwoven into your life that you just never sleep? (laughs) (laughs) You know, uh, I, I, I love that we can be involved in so many issues. I, 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 I relish it. I am honored and privileged for the ability to be at the forefront of so many issues impacting the lives of so many people. Um, it's always what I wanted to do in service. I wanted to have an impact. I wanted to uh, be able to uh, make the life circumstances of the people I'm fighting for better today than they were yesterday and, and, and to you know, improve lives and fight for justice. And um, when I got elected, to my very first office. So I'm in an elected office for the first time and you know, I'm um, getting into the role, um, easing into it, learning. Um, someone gave me some unsolicited advice and said, you're not gonna be able to do everything. So pick one or two, maybe three at max issues, make them your signature issues, what you will be known for, and then leave the rest for someone else. And I've never listened to that advice, and I never will. <laughs> I, I, especially now, when we have six, nearly 6,000 incredibly talented Californians fighting for us on our team in the California Department of Justice, 1,200 attorneys, I sometimes say to my staff, don't tell me there's not someone on our team who can do this. I know there's someone who can do this, so let's do it. Yeah. Our goal is to be at the best um, and at the forefront of every one of those issues. I want people to know and think that their attorney general is fighting for them on the issue that they care most about. And that issue is different for every person. Um, And it might not be an issue that we charted in our, um, in our, um, you know, strategic planning retreat, (laughs) but it's the most important issue to that Californian and they deserve someone who's going to fight for them, whether they are on the chart or not. And so to me, it's dynamic. The, the, what we, what's most important to us is what's most important to Californians. And it changes. When I became the attorney general, I came at a time of heightened hate crimes in the state of California. That was a top priority when I came in. I created a racial justice bureau. Gun violence was high. We created um, uh, more sharing of data to, to craft more solutions. Um, and then I didn't expect to be fighting for reproductive freedom as, as aggressively and with everything that we had. But the Dobbs decision dropped, and that's what we did because it was the thing that we should do and that Californians needed us to do in that moment. So rising to the moment, being responsive is a critical part of leadership. Not being frozen and static, but being dynamic and responsive to those who need you to fight for them. And so on all those issues, I, I love everyone. You know, I, I, I dig in deep enough to be dangerous. Um, I have a great staff um, who provides incredible support and, and, and teamwork and, and uh, you know, prepares um, options and actions um, that I can, um, um, you know, a- adopt and and green light and, um, you know, s- oftentimes massage and and get to a place uh, uh, where I'm excited about it. But uh, I would never give up the ability to be involved in so many issues. I I I, I um, love that on any and every issue that's important to Californians and to Americans, we have a key role um, and a key set of actions that we can take. Uh, to, to engage those issues and fight for Californians. So what are the, what are you rising to the moment right now and for the next six months say? What are the, what are the issues that are just slammed into your desk and people are yelling around and saying, we gotta do this? <laughs> um, crime is, is important right now, critical. And uh, we are, um, prioritizing and focused on, on, on crime, organized retail crime. I was here in LA uh, earlier today announcing a set of you know, multi-felony uh, um, uh, count complaint uh, where we were able to detect and deter and um, uh, dismantle a organized retail criminal group that had been stealing brazenly um, high-end products, mostly purses from, from um, high-end retail stores and, and, and reselling them online. And that's exactly what we should be doing, teaming up, partnering, working with our local law enforcement partners, sending out the message that if you engage in this conduct, you'll be caught and that we're, we're looking, um, we're investigating, we're focused on, on, on this um, issue and this crime. Um, human trafficking has been a top issue. Um, 
or we've been involved in, in, in takedowns of organized criminal groups across the state, um, able to provide services and support to the, to the victims and the survivors um, and make sure that the abusers are, are held accountable. Um, gun safety has been a top issue and will continue to be. We're defending our common sense gun laws in court um, against many challenges. We were in the Ninth Circuit en banc today uh, defending our um, large capacity magazine ban, our, when I say our, it was voted on by the people of California. Um, and uh, we continue to fight for, for reproductive freedom to make sure that f folks have uh, legal and safe access to reproductive health care uh, when they need it. So th those are coming to the forefront. H homeless housing, you know, we created a whole housing justice unit that had never before existed in the California Department of Justice. And I don't think when people think about the the, the top cop or the attorney general of California, they think this is the person that's going to help get more housing built. But I feel um, uh, very humbly that we have a very critical role to play to enforce the pro-housing laws of the state of California, to make sure that no one is able to uh, shirk their responsibility or brazenly violate the law. And unfortunately, there are those out there who are trying. Uh, cities have duties to build. Uh, we need two to three million more housing units in the state of California by 2030. We're not on pace. We have laws that expedite housing and streamline housing and provide for more housing to be built more quickly. And some cities are just saying, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna follow the law of the, of the state of California. Um, ironically, there's a, these are some cities that also like to talk a lot about um, the need for uh, you know, law enforcement and, and, and compliance with the laws. But they are brazenly violating the laws when it comes to housing. And so we're, we've come to assist them to, to follow the law. Uh, uh, with That's some, very kind so, of you. Sometimes with collaboration and, and urging and sometimes with lawsuits. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, yeah, I think we want to switch to Q&A uh, from the audience. And I don't know if we have some questions, but as we get these going, I wanted to ask you uh, one last question. I, I, I'm a historian, so of course I think history matters. But I wanted to ask you if it really does. So. Uh, <laughs> Here, here you are, the attorney general of the largest state, uh, making decisions that are going to shape the lives of millions of Californians and really set a model for the rest of the country. And when you're in that seat, um, does history factor into your decision making at all? Does it inspire you? Does it inform you? Or, or do you just ignore it and say, well, that's the past. I'm charting a future. Forget it. <laughs> I, I, I say a, a, both, a, a hybrid. Mm. Um, I, I was a history major. Mm. I studied history in college. Um, a lot of what I studied was the things that existed and occurred, but history didn't capture. And history didn't tell the story. Uh, the silences and the gaps in history and giving voice to those. Sometimes whole people and movements and figures, never, their, their history never told. And history is full of inspiration and, and, and clues for the future um, of um, you know, uh, cautionary tales. And um, I see all that in history. And, and you know, s some of the most inspiring people and um, occurrences have existed in, in, in history and, and continue to inspire me today, whether it be, you know, we talked about some of them already, that you know, the movements inspire me, the people who led movements inspire me, that created change, that uh, confronted injustices and help, helped um, address them. Um, so, and, and I also think that, that history, including the institutional history of institutions like the Attorney General's office or of states or governments when they have made mistakes in the past, you need to recognize those historical mistakes and acknowledge them, apologize for them, make sure they never happen again. Um, that's part of our work in, um, with respect to the reparations task force here in California, as well as an apology that we gave with respect to the Attorney General's role in uh, Japanese internment, mm -hmm. Japanese American internment, and taking land from uh, those with Japanese heritage, and um, also um, you know f fueling the, the internment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the figures you mentioned, Earl Warren, mm -hmm. one, of, one of the one of the greats, made some uh, took some really horrible actions that were unjust, and that we apologize for with respect to his role in those actions. So, um, history is, is important, um, but also you know. I always think you do have to charge ahead. You have to be in the here and now. You have to look at today's challenges. You know, with the wisdom and the um, uh, the guidance and the inspiration of the past. But 
Uh, you also can't think of history. Sometimes people say, where, where are you gonna be in history? That's for someone else to decide if they wanna decide it at a later time. I'm just thinking about how I'm gonna make someone's life better today. Mm. And I think if you keep your eye on the, on, on the goal, um, you can deliver. Thanks. So I think we have some questions from the audience. We do. We have two questions about homelessness that are gonna sort of put together. Um, as Attorney General, what plans or call to action would you recommend to address homelessness in California? And as part of that, should, ho should the homeless be able to sue the state for negligence? We need to create greater opportunity to, for more people to have a safe and affordable home. It's too expensive in California. Um, the, the median price for a home is $800,000. And a lot of people, including me, are asking themselves, how are my kids ever gonna own a home? And the dream of home ownership was something that was realized in the past um, by those in the middle class. And it was more universally accessible and um, um, able to achieve by more people. And there's some common sense supply and demand uh, uh, principles that dictate if we build more housing, it'll be more affordable, it'll be more accessible, more available to more people. I, we're pushing for that. We're pushing for more cities to follow the law of the state of California and build more housing, to open it up and get more units up as fast as possible. We also, um, that's on the supply side for more housing. We also wanna prevent people from becoming homeless. And so, Part of that is protecting tenants from being improperly evicted into homelessness in a way that's uh, discriminatory or retaliatory or arbitrary. And so we also protect the, the strong tenant protection laws of the state of California. Um, you can be evicted as a tenant. Uh, it has to be a just cause, uh, but you shouldn't be treated uh, unfairly or unlawfully in, as part of your eviction. Um, and then, you know, with respect to folks on, on the street, homeless Californians. Uh, I believe in our care court system, uh, which is a, a system that the, the government um, of, of California, our legislature and our governor have, have put into place that I'm defending in court as a law of the state of California that um, says that when someone is, is homeless, if they are provided with um, compassion and humanity and care in the form of services, housing, supports that meet their needs, um, they no longer can be voluntarily unhoused. They need to come indoors, receive that housing, receive those services, receive that care, and be moved off the street and into compassionate, supportive care and housing. Um, that's the law of the state of California. I, th I think that's the right approach. I also think we need to build more um, residential, um, units for providing mental health services, as well as um, addressing uh, drug use and substance use, drug addiction. We have a proposition that we're counting ballots on every day uh, to see if uh, a major contribution to those residential units are gonna be provided here in the state of California, proposition one. Um, so those are all parts of the solution. I think um, we need to be more urgent in our efforts, but we can never lose our humanity and our compassion. These are people, these are Californians. Um, they deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. And when they're provided with that serv those services and that housing, they should come off the street and come indoors. So can I push back just a tiny bit? And I, I mean it quite honestly. You know, I live in Echo Park. There used to be a huge encampment during the COVID times in Echo Park itself. Uh, and it was swept by the police one night as my wife and I were walking home. And uh, the group that was supporting those people reported six months later that the vast majority of them were back on the street. Because what had happened was when they were moved inside, they weren't allowed to take their dogs, they weren't allowed to go with their girlfriends, they weren't allowed to go with their property, that it, in some sense, it wasn't supportive. It might be supportive medically, but it wasn't supportive in the way that human beings live. How do you, how do you um, balance what their need is with the desire to actually get them housed? 
And how do we, as a California, recognize that that incredible, complex contradiction that we all think everybody wants to be housed, but they don't necessarily want to be housed the way the government right. is housing them. Right. And uh, how do we deal with that? I think the answer to your question is in your question, that we need to provide the broad variety of uh, flexible supports that people need. You should be able to, to be housed with your pet. You don't need 10 million rules. Congregate settings aren't for everybody. You should be able to be with your children. You should be able to be housed with your partner. Um, it's possible. We have relatively um, you know, a, a, a affordable pathways to, to, to single unit housing, to small homes um, where an individual can have the dignity of their own you know, door and key. It's their home. They can live there with, you know, their family unit, however they define it. They can put their things down. And um, we should be, we shouldn't fight back on that. We should be open to accommodation within reason to that. Um, so, you, you, you know, th th that has, has been off discussed and, and I think is um, the inability to provide um, housing that accommodates the unique needs of different unhoused Californians has created a problem to be able to um, have people move indoors and stay indoors and off the streets. Yeah. Okay, we're going to come back to criminal justice in just a second because we have a couple of questions, but I just love this one. So how can your office encourage ISP to work <laughs> to close the digital divide, especially now that the federal ACP program is ending that will impact 3 million Californians? Do you know what those acronyms are? <laughs> I don't Most have to. <laughs> you know, I just want to ask. <laughs> you know the, the digital divide has been something that's been um, long discussed, uh, an area of, of priority and passion in the California state legislature, also in the federal yeah. government. There's been deep investments made at the federal level, at the state level, to close the digital divide, to provide that sort of last mile to the, the places in urban and rural areas where it's, uh, they can be difficult to reach. And I think that the important values proposition is that, is that most people believe that there should be uh, access, uh, digital access for everyone, um, and that it's a fundamental part of um, being able to live in today's modern uh, uh, you know, day and age. And uh, there's also, you know, a fee on our on our um, on our bills that helps pay for, um, you know, greater access for, for more individuals because the, the free market forces on their own don't support building um, uh, infrastructure and access in some of these places. It needs to be subsidized for government. That's government's role. Um, so I think there have been some good some good um, progress made at the federal level and the state level. Although, as I understand it, there's a real issue with uh, deep rural communities. Um, we're doing much better in urban areas than we are in rural areas around the idea of, because the extension of, of digital infrastructure right. is really harder to do out there. And, and it could be miles and miles of uh, you know, line that to serve a handful of people, and and the you know the ROI, the return on the investment doesn't make any sense, yeah. and it could be some challenging terrain as well. So, uh, but I, but the you know, it, we'll, we're continuing to work on how we get there. I think one of the important steps is the belief that this isn't just something that if you can get it on the market, you 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 can benefit from it. If you can't, um, then you'll have to live without. I think people will understand that um, everyone needs access. Uh, it, it's something that, you know, I've been teaching social policy for a really long time, and it's a remarkably continuous issue, the digital divide. It used to be among uh, any kind of minority group really had trouble getting any kind of internet access. And then people began to realize, oh, it's not just minorities, but it's rural residents are really stuck, especially in the Midwest, where the spaces are so big mm -hmm. that it's really hard. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have two different approaches to criminal justice that, you know, as I said, I teach a class in restorative justice and it's really interesting to, to see the two together. And that is, um, the first one is, what do you think is the role of civil civilian oversight in police and justice systems? And the second one is, 
have the calls for criminal justice reform sent the wrong message to bad actors? Has the pendulum swung too far? What's the right balance? Two great questions. Um, and by the way, I didn't forget about that one about the, the negligence. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 was I just remembered and, and deliberately yeah. avoided it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, I'll just talk about that really quick. Uh, so, so I guess the, the answer is it depends. You know, for, for a, a negligence cause of action, it's very specific. You need to have a, a duty, a breach of duty, a cause, a causation, and damages. So if, if you're able to prove that, that the state had a duty, it violated its duty, it's caused damages, and um, then, then, then there could be if there's not some sort of you know, sovereign immunity or, or other defenses uh, in, in the way. But um, I don't think that, that lawsuits based on negligence are the pathway to address housing and homelessness. It, it's more the, the, the policy, the investments, a lot of what we've just discussed about the best way to provide uh, for people um, uh, who are on the streets what they need and to, to keep them off uh, the streets and, and you know, towards permanent housing and thriving lives. So civilian oversight is, I, I generally support it. I think that it's another layer of, of transparency, of um, everyday people engagement. I think there, there uh, needs, there's a, a, often a, a learning curve that needs to be uh, adopted to understand the, the policies and practices and um, the different important principles that are being balanced uh, by uh, law enforcement and the important work that they do to keep us safe. I've always believed that um, it is a false choice to say you can, uh, we can either be safe and um, have our constitutional rights and civil rights honored and, and adhered to, or we can have our constitutional rights and civil rights um, honored, but you're gonna be less safe. Uh, we need to be both. I don't see any other way around it. Um, we, we deserve to be uh, safe and we deserve to have our constitutional and civil rights protected, no matter who we are. And we can do both. Uh, we need to be ambitious enough uh, to fight for both. And um, civilian oversight is, can be an important um, watchdog and monitor to make sure that um, while law enforcement keeps us safe, our, our civil rights and, and rights are being um, honored as well. And we can also, sometimes it's a pathway to new approaches. Um, you know, the, the, the best thing to do going forward is not always the thing you've always done. It, it could be something different. Uh, the thing that we've always done could be rife with injustice or unintended consequences and be deserving of change. We need to be open to that. So criminal justice reform has been a, a pushback on some of the, the broken parts of our system. It's right to call out broken parts of our system, uh, to say that uh, we've had, we have mass incarceration, we've, we had over-arresting and over-prosecution, we had um, disparate impacts based on race uh, that none of us want to have in our criminal justice system and, and, and how can we change it? How can we make it better? Um, and you know, we have some in California that would be considered reform, the, the, the Racial Justice Act, which requires uh, remedies. Uh, sometimes it could be a, another trial or, or, or a change in sentence if race was improperly used in convicting you of a crime. That's reform. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, race should not be part of the, what convicts you of a crime and what your sentence is. Um, you know, the broader question of, you know, the, 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 the view of reform of the, or the narrative of reform. Um, my view is that the pendulum swings back and forth. Um, where, it needs, where it should be is where people are arrested for committing crime and they're held accountable in a way proportionate to the crime that they committed. We haven't always done that. Uh, we have given excessive sentences for lower level crimes. Um, people have been convicted when they're innocent. Those are deserving of change and reform. Um, but you, we, we, we have never said, and we should never say, um, that crime is allowed, that there's no punishment for crime. Um, and we're not saying that now. Um, we have uh, misdemeanors and felonies. We have different types of crime. Um, the, to my point about the science and the data, the thing that deters people from committing crime is the belief that they will be arrested if they commit it. Not 
that they will get 10 years for the committing it uh, instead of five. People don't say, if I commit this crime, I'm cool doing five years in prison. I just can't do 10. <laughs> they say, I don't expect to get arrested, so I'm gonna take the risk. So we have to arrest people for whatever crime they commit and hold them accountable in a way that's proportionate to what they, they've done. Um, arrest rates are, are, are low. Many crimes are never resolved. Uh, no, one is a, no, one, no one is arrested for it, identified for it, um, convicted of it, much less convicted of it. And so um, more steady, consistent arresting of people for the crimes they committed with proportionate accountability is the pathway forward in my view. Okay, I know that Patrick wants to conclude this, but I have to ask one last question. <laughs> we know you don't want to be attorney general forever. <laughs> <laughs> So what's your future hold, perhaps? Thank you uh, for the question. I've, um, I, I've always believed that it, an important part of um, being the best leader you can be is focusing on the job that you're in when you're in it. And so I'm in my, my first four-year term of a possible two four-year terms as attorney general. I just finished my first year uh, of, of that four-year term. I'm in my second. And there's a lot of work to do and a lot of people, depending on the AG, to deliver. So we're focused on that. Um, I also think that the best audition for anything that's next is being as great as you can be in the job that you're in. So I'm gonna be the best AG I can and uh, see what happens next. But I, I've always wanted to um, have the most impact on the most people. Uh, AG has provided me that, afforded me that wonderful opportunity compared to my prior role as, an, as a legislator. And uh, if there's another role for me in the future, it will be something where I can help more people in even more powerful ways. Excellent response. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>